So when the Apollo astronauts went to the moon... They were treated to views of the lunar surface that we get to see in our own telescopes. So today I'm going to talk you through my approach to high resolution lunar imaging. What's wonderful about this approach is that we can actually peer inside craters. We can resolve geological faults on the lunar surface. So I'm going to talk you through the setup, how we capture images, and then how I process them to reveal all this fine details hidden in the data. And as always, don't forget to subscribe, and I look forward to bringing you more videos as we explore the night sky. So this is the telescope that I've got. This is my Celestron C11, and this is the high-speed planetary camera. So I'll typically record for lunar imaging video files of 10,000 frames. And what I do is I pass that video file through the free software that rejects all the blurry frames, all those distorted by the Earth's atmosphere. And then we stack the sharp ones, the ones that are left behind, one on top of the other. That boosts the signal and averages out the noise. So we can then process that final stacked image. And the good thing about that is it actually reveals details, finer details, far better than I can see in the eyepiece. So let's talk through the setup then. As I'm saying, this is the ZWO ASI224 color camera. And these cameras are quite sensitive into the infrared. So you have to have an infrared cut filter, screw that on the front, and that stops that infrared bleed through getting onto the chip so you get a much sharper, sharper image. And while I'm talking of filters, I also have an infrared filter, a 685 nanometer filter that passes through the infrared filter, so actually not getting any optical light. And the reason for that is that the seeing is much better in the red, up in the infrared. So if the seeing's bad, if there's a night of bad seeing, which inevitably it always is where I am, a 685 nanometer IR filter is what I use. And that cuts through the seeing much better than using just the optical filter we have in there. I have a times two barley screwed into the atmospheric dispersion corrector and what I'll do I'll line up on a star that is the same altitude as the moon I'll check my atmospheric dispersion corrector get that into the right place by adjusting the levers and then with that times two bar low in there that's the equivalent focal length of having the bar low. so I've unscrewed the lens and just put it on the ADC so I'm just using the 685 by itself then um, you don't really have to use the ADC you can just put the levers together but because i use this for my planetary setup i just have it all as it is and if i'm using the infrared filter i can just put the levers together and of course with the infrared filter you're just shooting in that very narrow part of the spectrum you're just at the red end so although yes the adc will make a difference i find it's not so critical when you're shooting in infrared the other thing i have done which has made a massive improvement to my processing is having a motorized focuser that is one of the things that really changed my approach to lunar and planetary imaging so with this then just touches on the buttons i can adjust the fine focus and that gets rid of all the image takers you touch the focuser wheel to try and get that fine focus particularly if the seeing is poor every time you touch the focus wheel the telescope will shake so having hands-free focus control is absolutely wonderful i couldn't imagine now going back to a telescope that didn't have a motorized focuser. So you must have a well collimated telescope. You're not gonna get good images unless your telescope is collimated. And I would check this collimation every month or so. Of course, mine's a permanent setup, so it's not going to move. But if I was driving out to our dark sky site, or if I was setting up in the garden, then I'd be checking the collimation every time I set up. So the other thing I do as well is make sure that telescope is cooled to ambient. If you brought your telescope out from the nice warm house, of course it's nice and warm you put it outside in the cold air and then it gets that heat plume rising up that then destroys the local seeing so make sure your telescope's cool to ambient this of course is kept in the observatory so i just roll the roof back and let it slowly equalize over the next few minutes and i've also put because this is a closed tube it's got the big lens big corrector plate at the front uh, this has a heat blanket on on the side of it and that stops the telescope from over cooling from radiating up to the coldness of space and that just helps form the tube, stops the tube from overcooling and producing tube currents, cold air currents that then sink back down the telescope. 
So make sure your telescope is collimated, make sure you've got a telescope that's cooled to ambient, and then make sure you can get an accurate focus. So what we'll do now, I'll go and get ready for a night under the stars, go and get my cold weather clothing on, and we'll go and have a look at the moon. So just as we start to do the capture sequence, there's two things I quickly want to run through. The first is that I use Fire Capture to control the astronomy capture. It's a freeware program. It controls a whole variety of astronomy cameras, and you can use that to control the settings, control how the video is saved, the format, and you also get the preview of what the camera is seeing as well. And the second point to mention is the F ratio we want to be shooting at. Now the moon and the planets or features on the moon are small, as are the planets, so we want to be shooting at a long F ratio, a high F ratio, to get that image scale to resolve those small differences. It's very opposite to what the deep sky images want to do, where they want to have a small, a low F ratio to get that nice bright image. And the rule of thumb is to look up the pixel size of your camera, multiply that pixel size in micrometers by five, and that gives you your F ratio. So my camera, the ASI224, has 3.75 micrometer pixels, so we'll call that F20, which is therefore just means I need a times two parlo with my telescope. And that means I'm shooting at the correct sampling size for the pixels at the optical diffraction resolution limit of the telescope. Let's go and have a look at the system. Moon, go to. Oh, look at that crater. I do love looking at the moon. Check the focus. Look at that. So you think it's all right tonight. Well, that doesn't look too bad, does it? Gosh. Oh, that beautiful crater. They call these four fractured craters. They've got these central cracks in the middle. Look at that. That's pretty spectacular, isn't it? So we're all nicely set up in the observatory. We've got the telescope pointing at the moon. We've got the camera in. I've checked the collimation, make sure we're nice and sharp. And I've given the telescope a few minutes for it to cool down and reach thermal equilibrium. I've checked focus. I've gone back and forth with focus using the motorized focuser. We've got the camera in. I plugged this into the USB 3 port on the laptop. And the reason for that is that gives you just a faster data rate of the frames down into the camera. So let's look at fire capture and the settings that I'm going to use. And the most important is that I'm recording at around about 80% of the histogram. That's key to the image. Any brighter, then you run the risk of overexposing any dimmer and you're not getting the full dynamic range. So 70 to 80%, somewhere around there, is where we want to be aiming at. I'll generally start my gain will be around 300, 400, depending on how bright the scene is with an exposure of around five to 20 milliseconds. So depending on how bright that scene is, where I adjust it to. And again, your settings will vary. Your telescope will be different to mine, your camera, your F ratio. So do whatever works for you, but that'll be a good start of a 10. But the key is making sure that the histogram is at three quarters. And a useful tip, rather than adjust the sliders by using the mouse or using the touchpad, is you can use the arrow keys to adjust the exposure and the gain. So up, down, left, right adjust that so it's quite a useful way to do it without fiddling around with the sliders. I like to use put the reticle on and then I line that up with the feature of interest at the centre of the scene that I'm trying to shoot and that just tells me if I just need to nudge the drive get that centred in the field of view again. I'm typically going to record either five or ten thousand frames. Obviously the more frames you record the more chance you have of capturing some five ten percent of those will be nice and sharp but the downside is of course that hoovers up space on the hard drive so a 10,000 frame video file at full resolution on this camera is 12 gigabytes. So it doesn't take long before my laptop's full, the hard drive's full. So if I want to shoot a number of objects or make a mosaic, I might only shoot at 5,000 frames and you can adjust that to what works for your setup and your scene conditions. So I also periodically check the focus. I run through focus two or three times, just making sure it's nicely focused. And there's two reasons for that. First is that the telescope will cool as the night goes on, so it'll, it'll contract a little bit. So you want to be checking for focus. And also, being a Cassegrain telescope, that's where the primary mirror moves. That's how the telescope itself focuses. So this will slowly settle as the night goes on. So I periodically need to quickly run through the focus 
And perhaps one other important point I should have mentioned back at the beginning is that obviously this is a tracking mount. So you can do this with a non-tracking mount with a push telescope, with a Dobsonian telescope. And you'll have to let the feature of interest on the moon slowly crawl across the field of view as you capture your frames. Obviously that's possible, but it's so much easier with a tracking mount. So I'd always suggest using a tracking mount. Of course, if you haven't got one, just use what you've got. Right, so I've caught four videos. And what we'll do now is we'll come out of the observatory and then we'll start stacking those and then sharpening them up. So we're going to download two bits of freeware to process our images. The first is auto stack it, and that will stack all the sharp frames from our video files. It will reject all those blurred by the atmosphere. And the second piece of software is called Registax. So Registax has a sharpening function that we can then use to sharpen the resulting stack. So auto stack it to reject all the blurry ones and stack the good ones, and then Registax will use them to sharpen that resulting image. Right, so we've got the four video files on the screen, and I have SER Player, I've downloaded it, it's a free download, and we can inspect each video file in turn. This is Gardner, or one of the craters is Gardner, but this here is one of the largest volcanoes on the moon. This is the Gardner Megadome. And there's a split in this in the in the mountain itself where the one side of it slipped away with all the geological faults and there's a little ghost crater in here so it's a really fascinating area to study these are the craters atlas and hercules two beautiful craters and what i like about this is you've got just got the peaks catching the sunlight there so the crater floor is in shadow and then you just see the peaks there catching the sunshine catching the sunlight in the morning this is Posidonius, this floor, fra floor fractured crater, which is these riles and cracks. And again, that's a geological fault that's underneath the surface. It's pushed the floor of the crater up and you can see where the lava's come through and flooded the interior of the crater. One of my favourite views on the lunar surface is this here. This crater is called Couchy. And you have, and I can't remember which one it is. This one's a geological fault where the surface of the moon has split apart like a rift valley and the surface has dropped in the middle and then this one here this lower one the southern one is a geological fault but it's a slope it's a cliff where the surface of the moon now falls down and then levels out again and you have two little volcanoes the couchy domes two little lunar volcanoes down there as well so that's using ser player just to inspect the video files what i'll do then i'll stop that shrink all this down and this is my latest picture this is the picture of Stonehenge we went up to Stonehenge the other night and we had Venus Saturn Jupiter and the crescent moon all right we're going to open up a program called auto stack it so this is a freeware program it's by a Dutch software astronomer Emil and what it does is going to stack the 10,000 frames we've taken it'll find the sharpest one picture we will then tell it to stack the next thousand, so that's 10%, next thousand frames, one on top of the other. We're going to reject 9,000 blurry ones. We'll just stack the best 1,000. That boosts the signal, and what it does is it averages out the noise, so the noise actually becomes quite uniform, so we can then further process that and reveal finer details. So all I'm going to do then is press open, and those are the four there. So there's our picture. Let's go back to this first screen here. So we need to have it on surface. Oh, and as you can see there, I've batch processing so that we do all four at the same time. So here is our first video file. So we're going to move the anchor square there and we're looking for a high contrast feature somewhere where the software can detect right that's the center of the picture and I can then stack all the pictures on top of there if you choose a mural region here you haven't got so much contrast so there's nice white gray darker regions as well it might even be better actually putting it on a crater itself somewhere vaguely near the center software can pick up what's a good anchor feature now I normally leave mine on noise robustness of four or five. So I leave it on expand and I'll crop it later in Photoshop. Then we click analyze. And what the software is doing now is going through each frame in turn, lining up and stabilizing on the anchor feature. That's why we want a high contrast feature. We don't want something that's more uniform, something down here. 
we want that nice white and dark and if you look here we're looking at the first frame you can see it's this sort of peppery grainy sort of texture that's the noise we're shooting at quite short exposures so we can try and capture those brief moments of clarity if we had a longer exposure of course we would get more atmospheric turbulence in each frame so we're sh shooting at short exposures 10 milliseconds thereabouts if i remember rightly so while that is just crunching and it does take a while let's open this up so if we open up each one in turn fire capture does save what camera you've used what filter you've used the date the time how, how long the exposure was date format so shutter speed was five milliseconds gain was 300 so if you find a set of exposures that does work depending on and tune that down for your camera for your telescope you can then come back and look at those in the settings afterwards so you can see autostackert has finished so if you have a look up here that's our sharpest frame let's move that in a little bit let me get a bigger image so our sharpest frame is number 7465 of 10,000. So if we go through, they'll all move around. You can see they're tracking there as it's going through the sharpest. So we're now down about halfway now. And then our worst frame was frame number 10,000. And you can see there the effect of the atmospheric seeing. The image is very distorted. So you can see what's happened here. This graph gives you the same thing. So the gray line is the sharpness of the frames throughout the video in the order that they were recorded. And then what Autostack has done is then put them in sharpness order. So we had a very steep drop off, seeing obviously wasn't as good as I thought it was. Very ordinary and then drops off at the end. So if we stack 10%, which is down there somewhere, we've got all the sharp frames and you can actually make a judgment call of where it, the graph starts to fall off. So somewhere maybe even around five or 10% is really where we want to be. The further down this to go, of course, the more and more blurry flames, frames you're stacking, so you're losing detail. I long for the day when this graph actually goes all the way along here and then drops down at the end, but my seeing is never that good. So we've checked our sharpness. Now the noise robustness we talked about before, if it's picked up noise as fine details, you can then have a play around with that. So it's always worth just checking. You've got your noise robustness in the right place. And it really is stacking and sorting from sharpest where you can see all the fine details down to the worst where you can hardly see anything. So we've had a look at the quality graph. We've checked that it's all in the right order. We're happy then with our noise robustness. It hasn't been picking up noise as fine details. And I'm going to tell it to stack 1000 and 2,000 frames. I could put 4,000 and 5,000 frames, but I don't think I need to. The alternative, of course, the alternative, of course, is you can then put a percentage in if you wish. I like just doing numbers. I don't know why, but 1,000 and 2,000 is about right. And we can see here we've got 10,000 frames stacked. The way Auto Stack Up works is it's going to take each frame, it's going to break each frame down into little squares, and then recombine them back together. So we're going to break this picture down this frame our frame let's go back to the sharpest break it down into the sharpest frame so i'm going to tell it to do 104 pixels i find for me that's about the right size to use some people go smaller and finer some people go for bigger and coarser but 104 tends to work for me if you go too small you run the risk of mosaicing so you get this little grid pattern so let's quickly put that in so we'll place the ap's in the grid and the problem is, as you can see, we get this nice little grid pattern. So when Auto Stack it puts them all back together, you run that risk of it looking like a sort of paving grid line. So if you click multi scale and place APs in the grid, you get lots of different size squares when it's finished thinking. So you can see we've got some original 104 pixel squares and we've obviously got some that are much larger and some that will be somewhere in between. And what that's doing is because it's therefore smoothing over a number of squares, so you've got lots of little squares and then smoothing over a number of big squares, you reduce that risk of getting that mosaicing pattern. So I always click multi-scale around 104. Some people go finer. I find there's not really a lot of benefit in doing that. So I find it will take a lot longer to process if you go finer. So 104 pixels works well for me. 
but most important of course is to click multi-scale and then i will click stack so if we look across at auto stack it you can see there we now have green ticks all the way along and so we know now that the image is is processed and if you can see there you see as we were talking about before all the alignment points are set up we've got small squares and big squares so jumping back to windows explorer looking in the ser files folder where i'd saved mine we've got the original video files and then these are our stacks of 1000 so you can see they're much smoother the noise has disappeared you know we've lost that sort of grainy texture that salt and pepper texture there's the two craters there's the four fractured crater Posidonius, and there's those geological faults in Mare Tranquillitatis. So what I'll do now, we will go into Registax. We will tell it to go select. So here is our picture of the lunar volcano, the, the Gardner Megadome. So we're not going to stack the images in Registax, we're only going to sharpen them. Now, Registats has a series of sliders, six sliders of varying strength and magnitude. And it's a bit of a black art sliding these back and forth, adding in sharpness values. And then of course, the more you sharpen, the more you also amplify the signal, you more the more you amplify the noise. So then there's a denoise, which smooths out any inadvertent noises that's added. So the easiest way to do this is go use linked wavelets. He has a think, and I slide the top one all the way to the right. That's brought out some finer detail there. Now, because I've been shooting through the filter, I am just going to balance out the colours. Let's auto balance that, make it look a bit more natural. So let's bump that up to say 0.25. So what we do now is we add ever stronger sharpening and denoise until the images are sharp so we get so that's far 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 too sharp but what we can do is it starts to look more like a newspaper print we can add in some denoising and that smooths out that pepper you can see we've got loads of fine detail visible now but we've got this horrible grainy texture so that looks a bit better so let's bump that up again 0.5 so we can see now we've got features visible inside the crater. The ghost crater's come on, but that looks a little bit too much process for me. So I'm going to bring that down to, say, 0.15. And I iterate back and forth until I can't get the image any sharper. So again, but let's try then, let's try 0.2. I'm literally just iterating back and forth, trying to see what works. Straight away, you can see just as it comes through the next level of sharpening. There's this geological fault, this sort of landslip that's moved this surface down to the right. This side's quite smooth, and that's the fault where it's the Gardner Dome, the Mega Dome has slipped to the right. So that's not looking too bad. We've got details visible in the crater here. We've got features visible on the, on the mountain, on the volcano itself, and that ghost crater there. So that's not looking too bad. Let's see if we can get rid of a little bit of denoise, because of course, the more you denoise, the, the more blurred the fine details come. So let's bring that down a little bit, see what that happens. And it is just a process of iteration, add a bit of sharpening, add a bit of denoise, see if you can go back a bit. If you can't, then we know we're there. So it's just a process of iteration, add a bit of sharpening, add a bit of denoise, see how far you can get away. So straight away, again, that's reduced that, that detail down again. Let's see if we can boost that again, 0.3. But I'm looking at that now, I can see there's lots of noise uh, down here. So I think we need to try it a little bit more. So I'll go 0.35. So I think yeah, it's still a bit noisy. So let's try, so maybe 0.375. And I always try and get it, so it looks pretty smooth. You can go into Photoshop and add a denoise or a, a despeckle feature, but I find it's quite good to get it all out, out here first. So let's try 0.4 then. So we're back to where we started at 0.4. And because we've ticked the use linked wavelets, that's cascading down through all the different sliders. That's all you have to use. So let's see if we can get a little bit more sharpening in there, 0.25. So that's obviously too sharp. You can see here we're blowing out the highlights. We've got loads of white stuff here. So we'll see, let's go down a bit then, 0.225. I think 
0.21 might be the best. So that doesn't look too bad, does it? So we could have a play around with that, see if we can get it a little bit better, but just by trying that process of iteration, boosting up the sharpness, corresponding amount of denoise, and it's just a process of iteration, sharpness and denoise, until you get an image that looks right. So I think actually having just looked away from the screen, I think I need to reduce that down. So what I will do now is I'm going to do an RGB align, and this puts a little green square up on the screen. And we're going to go over to that crater. And what it's going to do, it's going to look at the difference between the red and the blue. So you can see there's a little bit of blue fringing there. And because we weren't shooting the infrared, we were shooting an optical filter. We'll see what effect this has. And what it's going to do, it's going to look at the red, it's going to look at the blue, and it's going to correct that atmospheric dispersion and adjust the red and the blue so that they line up again. So this is what I call the poor man's atmospheric dispersion corrector. And it's moved it a few pixels. And again, that's just made that a little bit sharper and got rid of that blue fringing there. So let's see then, having done that, whether that actually allows us to get a little bit more out of the sharpening. So that does, but again, that looks over-processed to me. So we'll iterate between the two, 0.225. And as you sharpen it, of course, you boost the signal. So that already looks much better, doesn't it, having done the RGB align. So I think I'm going to save it as that. Save image. So if I call this folder linked wavelets, and I will save it in there. And this way I'm not saving over my stack. That's quite incredible. You can see it down here. That's a landslip off that mountain, off that volcano on the moon. So that when I load up my second image, so if I load up the couchy domes, it should apply the same wavelets. So it's very useful to have that set when you're going along in the image to image. So once you've got a setting that works well for the equipment, well for the night, it's then got that saved. It's done. And it's applied the same settings as we did before. So if I RGB balance, black and white grayscale scene, there we go, and I can choose the RGB align on this very bright crater. And you can see there we've got blue and we've got red again. There we go. And again, we've got rid of that red-blue fringing just by using the RGB align on the moon image. I love this. You get these two little volcanic domes. These are, these are small shield volcanoes on the surface of the Sea of Tranquility. And you can see there the cliff. You can see the slope. And this here is a, is a cleft. This is a, where the fault, the lunar surface has split apart and the bit in the middle has sunk down inside. Whereas the southern region, southern is actually a slope at an angle with two little lunar volcanoes. So a completely different scene to what we had before. So we'll save that as an image. Just plonk it in there. And what I'll do now is I'll select the, let's do, do the two bright craters. And with luck, this should be exactly the same settings. Here it comes now. So again, RGB balance, click the auto balance. And you can see on the histogram now, we've got a much darker scene. We've got a lot more black in the scene with all the crater are much closer to the terminator. Hence the histogram is much more shifted to the left. And I'll hit RGB align, move that. Let's cover the whole crater. So if you do get this impression here where it's very heavily processed, you can see very bright, very oversaturated, you can just reduce the slider down ever so slightly. And that does give a much cleaner looking image. There we go. So it just gets rid of some of that over intensity. I might just knock that down just slightly. Right, let's save that as an image. Shooting the Terminators really hard because you get very bright regions. These crater rims, for example, are catching the morning sunlight. We always get very dark regions uh, deep in the lunar shadows, deep in the shadows of the crater walls. So you've got this very bright region right next to a very dark region. So the camera does struggle to pick up this dynamic range. But this is where the most dramatic scenery is, right alongside these crater walls. But I do like those crater 
those mountain peaks just peeking out. Right, I think we've got one more, haven't we? We've got the crater, floor fractured crater just to do. Look at that, beautiful. Right, let's do the RGB balance. Auto balance there. So you can see here we've got much less of the dark regions just because we're further away from the Terminator. We'll just do a quick RGB align. Grab the whole crater. But if you, even just while this is processing, if you look at the video file when we were looking at this crater, this floor fracture crater, there's no way we could see on the raw video feed all these fine details. And these have come about because we've taken literally just our sharpest, we've taken our 1000, our 2000 sharpest frames, stacked them all together, and then by applying this sharpening, it brings out all this fine resolution. So I think we could actually sharpen this up a little bit more. It's a little bit soft around here, so we can add a little bit more sharpening. That's brought us a little bit more. Let's try 0.2125. Again, we're a little bit overexposed here. So you can have a play around reducing the sliders, reducing, increasing the sharpen, and adding denoise and factoring. It's a bit of a trade-off between the two, but the key to it is using the link wavelets button. That just makes everything so much simpler. You're not sliding multiple sliders back and forth trying to play with different levels. But I think that looks quite quite an attractive image there. Right, save an image. So what I will do then, and let's minimize that. We will go into Adobe Photoshop. And because I'm cheap, I only have Adobe Elements. So here we are in Adobe Elements. I'll just shrink that down there so it fits on the screen. Let's grab the crop. We'll just get rid of those corners. There we go, get those nice mountains on the on the side. Just move up that crater there. I do love this view with the wrinkle ridges, with the, uh, I can never remember which one's which. One's a, a Rima and one's a Ryle, I think in the German uh, terminology. And there we are, we press control one and that's now at 100%. Let's get rid of you. So we'll go enhance. I'm just gonna turn it into a black and white. Just get rid of the color fringing Colour data is still there, but I've just made it black and white, just makes that a little bit better. I've got a little bit of a dust bunny there, um, but I'll leave that. I don't want to clone that out and replace it with false false data. But you can see the little volcanoes there, and we've got that little craterlet at the top, little crater peak at the top. But I think that looks okay. What I sometimes do is add a high pass filter, and the beauty of a high pass filter is it enhances all that signal, but doesn't necessarily boost the noise. So if we duplicate the layer, turn it into overlay, filter, other, high pass. And let's bring that down to sad notes like four. There we go. So it's brought out a number of these smaller features in there, but that does look quite nice, doesn't it? Okay, that's. And you can see the effect that it's had. Just boosting up those small fine details, just makes them pop a little bit more. That's quite pretty, isn't it? So let's do the same thing then. I'll tell you what I'm going to do. Oh, they said I didn't do one, but let's go and do the crater pair. So again, let's start off with a crop, just get rid of the edges, let's go down to about there. That's a black and white. Okay, layer, duplicate layer. Overlay, filter, other high pass. And again, that's brought out quite a few fine details that simply weren't visible before. And you can really see that effect there, can't you? All those little small craters, these little impact ridges and, and ejector ridges that's come out when the crater was formed.
Awesome. Okay, that is how I process my lunar images. So what are the key takeaways then from this process? So let's quickly run through everything then. So we've got to make sure the telescope is collimated. You're never going to get good images if the scope's not out of collimation. We want to make sure the scope is acclimatised. It's at the ambient air temperature, not too cold. And of course, not still warm from coming out of a nice warm house. We want to make sure we've got a good focus and that's much easier with a motorised focuser. We want to make sure the histogram on fire capture is around about three quarters. It could be 60, 70, 80%, something, somewhere around there. Any more than that, you're going to start overexposing and any less than that, you're going to reduce the dynamic range of the signal. In auto stacker, then I would be stacking 10 to 20% of the frames, the sharpest frames. And that's out of a 10,000 video frame stack, that's one or 2,000. So 10 or 20 or one or 2,000. And I will also use that multi-scale. So that multi-scale reduces that chance of the getting that pixelation, that sort of Im that mosaicing on the stacked image. And then in Registax, I use the linked wavelets tool and that just helps cascade all the way down the different layers. And I adjust the sharpen and the denoise and the slider on the first channel until we get that nice sharp image with all that beautiful detail. Bring it into Photoshop, which is where we are now. And again, convert it to a black and white object that still keeps the color data, but makes it look black and white add a gentle high pass filter and that brings out all the fine detail and that's all there is to it you can then add labels add feature names as you wish and i still find this incredible if you look at our first image of the video file the sharpest the stacked and then the one that's been processed in registax and then brought out the fine details in photoshop it's amazing that process how all that data all that data is still there in the video file, in the frames themselves. And it's just by following through that process that we can bring that all out. And as always, please don't hesitate to subscribe. And I look forward to bringing you more videos as we explore the night sky.